Oh yeah. Hey yo, it's the Russo Show. Hey yo, it's the Russo Show. All right, welcome everyone to this episode of Pizza Film School. Uh, I'm Joe Russo. Anthony Russo. We are here at Agbo, um, our uh, our film production uh, company, our studio. Our guest today is director and star Justin Chan. How do you handle, especially with your orientation as an actor, how do you approach the audition process? For me, because you know, as you guys know, aud auditioning is also a skill. So I try not to be wooed by that room. You know, I try to take a step back and 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 see them as you know. Also, the the other side of it is that maybe they had a bad day. So I'm not really focusing on that performance. I'm more like seeing the potential of 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 what can be on my films. I can reach out separately and I can have these long conversations and maybe meet with them and maybe work with them. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm really looking for potential rather than out of the box, you know, because sometimes there's things to be mined, you know, like the little girl, she, she'd only done one other little thing, you know, and, and, but I could tell if I just had a little bit of time that there was something really special I can mine. I'm also, sometimes I bring my DP into the auditions and we'll move with the actor. Is this, is this person a little bit like intuitive, uh, you know, and can understand how to move with the camera and kind of dance with us? Um, what kind of screen presence do they have? You know, I'm not necessarily looking for a technical actor, you know, always. So like some parts, you need a very technical actor who can deliver because you know that you're not gonna have that much time for that section. So for example, the lawyer character, Vondi Curtis Hall, I knew that that's a very hard part because it's very expository, but you have to deliver it in a way that's fresh and interesting and compelling. I'm gonna pick the most seasoned, your proficient, you know, actor for that role because we don't have time to mess around, and he's got to come in for for two three days and just kill it. Now, some of these other characters, like uh, the guy who played the ICE agent, I found him at a GNC supplement store in Biloxi, Mississippi. I just, I had a conversation with him. He thought, I asked him if he'd be interested in, in working in a film. He said, absolutely not, because he thought I was shooting a porno. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> after having a little bit of conversation, he told me he had worked at Angola prison for eight years. I'm like, this guy's perfect, dude. This guy knows how to, you know, but also has a, a screen presence, a, a heart, and, and is a real person from the region. So building the, 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 the authenticity of New Orleans, he is, completely you know a valuable asset a lot of it just is is intuition and I think a lot of the intuition is just you know even as an actor being on set and just trial and error of seeing other people kind of experiment with what works and what doesn't can you talk a little bit color is really important in the movie will you talk a little bit about working with uh, your DP and your production designer on color schematics and and um, and why color is so important to you Everything that I'm doing in, in, in these films obviously is to bring empathy towards these adoptees. So it's got to make you feel something. And I think color is, if it's just for flash, I don't know how useful it is. I think if it can make you feel something, then it can be a very powerful tool. So, you know, when he's doing the motorcycle heist, if you notice, there's a lot of red. There's a lot of vibrancy, you know, and, and once he goes into the chop shop and cutting it all up like we had you know the the quintessential orange and blues but there are a lot of neons and and we use that low frame rate the, the red for me was was you know he's bleeding for it you know he's 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 bleeding to get that money and he's he's really sacrificing a lot of his you know ethics and you know morality he's built up to to, to create the family he has uh blue obviously is is a melancholy color so you know the 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 bayou is is uh you know filled with tons of blues. It always comes down to with my DP and production designer, how is this making us feel? Also with the production design, we're talking a lot about texture. I think New Orleans as a city is just so, has so much history and, and mood and, and, and visceral sort of environmental feeling that, that um, we didn't want anything to feel new. You know, even the motorcycle he rides is like completely distressed and taken down. Uh, and it is a yellow and you know we assign colors to each character you know Kathy was a very you know in service so she wore a lot of blues and and 
and uh, you know, nurse colors and, and uh, Antonio was salt of the earth, so he wore a lot of earth tones. Um, you know, uh, Sydney, the, the, the stepdaughter, was very colorful and vibrant, and that changes over time as well. It works very well. It was excellent use of color, especially when you combined it with your, your lens choices. Will you talk a little bit about your script writing process? Do you always write alone? Do you, being an actor, do you act out? Do you improvise the roles while you're writing? Is that how you come up with your dialogue? Usually, so th for this particular script, I didn't write for the first six months. I just talked to a lot of adoptees. I just tried to get into, get a sense of, of uh, the adoptee community and, and, you know, sort of their struggles. Um, once I started writing, I tend to usually do a first, like, quick vomit pass. So I just write all the way through, stream of consciousness and just, like, not have an outline and, and just write what I think the film should be and what comes next. And then after that is when the real work starts, is you have this document of just, you don't even know what it is. And you're like, okay, I got to make a story out of this. But like, I think what I find is in that process, for me at least, there are compelling things in it that, 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 that you're like, oh, this is interesting, this is interesting. And you try to put that into a bank and then you start to structure it out. And then I do kind of have to outline and sequence it out and all that. I don't act it out until we do some rehearsal. But during the rehearsals, I will I will change dialogue if, if necessary. Um, you know, also with with Blue Bayou, you know, I was I was writing from sort of what I think it should sound like in terms of jargon and, and what they should sound like being from New Orleans and Louisiana. But of course, as I go to, to New Orleans and spend a lot of time, I'll start rewriting and making sure that it feels more authentic. Um, and then, you know, the actors will know best. Like if they've done their homework, they're, they're going to be like, they wouldn't say it like that. Or if someone's local and they say, you know, they say it like this, I, I have no problem changing. After, after writing the script, how did you approach getting this movie financed and sort of figuring out how to, how to actually make it? Macro, uh, they, they commissioned the script. So they paid for the script. Um, and then once it was written, you know, it was about me pushing and being like, when are we going to make this and, and continuing to push and, and, and finding ways to incentivize, uh, you know, this kind of film getting made. You know, they set me up with a meeting with E1. I went in and I, I, I pitched to them what I think it should be. So they immediately walking out after they said they, they, they called Macro and said they wanted to make it. Um, but to get the script commissioned, you know, of course, I had to go and pitch to Macro what the idea was. Dramas are hard to get made. You know, they're, they're, they're very hard to get made. And I wasn't unrealistic when it came right time to writing the script. I, I tried to make it much more dynamic. You know, I didn't make it just two people in a room constantly talking. You know, there's motorcycle heists. You know, there's an airport scene. There are set pieces. You know, there's the midpoint, like a Vietnamese party and, you know, um, you know, finding ways like the name of the film, Blue Bayou, based off the Linda Ronstadt song, you know, like finding opportunities to also not, to make it a little bit bigger than just a kitchen sink drama, I think was very much in the interest of trying to get it made. As we all know, we live in a star system. So it's like, what's the name I can, I can hang this film off of? I'm not bringing that money, you know, so if I want to act in this, you know, I do need like somebody, you need the right mixture, you need somebody right for the role and also ha that has a right stature like Alicia Vikander. So, you know, I wrote her a letter. I got on uh, a few Zooms with her and, and really just poured my heart out and you know, anyone watching out there, it's like writing a letter can only help you and being as authentic and real and and just passionate is always probably the best policy instead of trying to like do some weird sort of pitch if it comes from somewhere real and you're, you're pitching to someone they can feel that and I think that's um, a very important uh, way to approach talent yeah no question I mean actors are artists artists respond to passion we found the same thing is that you know you have to have a strong motivation for doing what you're doing and then other people will feel that and the drive of that the energy behind that will, will it creates its own sort of centrifugal force. You know, it pulls things in. You have to use your passion as a driver to get um, movies made. They're all hard to get made, you know? 
Talk a little bit about uh, the editing process. Just walk us through how you like to edit. So I, my editor for every film has has been on with it been on set with me doing a rolling edit. Um, so they're constructing scenes. You know, um, again, this is an indie film, so like once we leave, there's no reshoots. <laughs> you know, um, so I. I'm viewing dailies or I'm viewing dailies and also, uh, uh, you know, assemblies at night after work. And I'm seeing how the scenes are playing. If, if we're missing anything, if something's not coming across and if there is something that's lacking, I'm trying to pick it up before we, before we wrap. So that's really helpful. So by the time I wrap though, I, I usually have like an assembly. I definitely, you know, do this sort of intuitive stuff like, Hey, that feels like too long or we need to get out of the scene earlier or, those I do those kind of trims first, and then to be honest, it, I do really approach it a lot. Like the writing is, I'll start to break it off into digestible chunks. I'll be like, okay, first half, second half. Where, where's the midpoint, and and is it leading? Are we leading to a midpoint, and is it paying off, and is it setting up uh, the second half of the film? And I'll break it in, you know, and then I'll break it down to acts. Then I'll break it down to sequences, and then I'll bring it down to scenes. I view my films. A lot so there comes a point in the edit I think you cannot tell if a certain change is what it's doing to the cut unless if you view it so that's like the really you know that's where it gets pretty painful is like you guys start watching your film an insane amount of times and you start and then and then uh, you start to lose a little bit of perspective you got to step away for a day or two and then come back and and um, you know that's that's always the most painful. And then when I get towards maybe um, a part of the process where I feel like okay, I got something, and this is something I can I can get notes on. I'll start screening it quite a bit. If ten people tell you the same thing, it's probably true. No matter how much you don't want to believe it, right? So if there's a scene that they're like, we don't understand what that scene is, and I don't think it's even necessary. You're like, no, 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 no. But this is what it's doing. Like, it, this is what it's doing. It's like, this is like the scene where the character, you can understand like his wound and they go, but yeah, I didn't get that. And you're like, yeah, you know, enough people tell you that you're like, shit, all right, that's gotta go. I mean, th th this has been a fascinating um, sort of survey of your process. But one thing I forgot to ask earlier was we just talk for a second about why you chose to shoot in 16 millimeter and what the stakes of that decision are on a, you know, potentially a financial level or a process level. You know, in this day and age, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a choice. It's, it's very much, you know, guns blazing type of choice because it's, it's not an easy process, especially shooting somewhere that doesn't have a lab. You know, always to me, this film felt so it's about real people and it's about a real issue that's going on in this country. I wanted to feel very visceral and tactile and real. Um, you know, I, I, I love Cassavetti films. You know, I love the films of the 70s. I, you know, I, I just think that there's this tactile truth in, in some of those films that, that feel like unadulterated. You're, you're almost seeing like real life happen. Even from when I was pitching to Macro, I said, and blah, 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 the story's this, that, and the other, and it's going to be shot on 16, you know? <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, 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 we'll talk about that 16 part, but we want to do this movie. And I think every step of the way, it, I had to be vigilant about, and it's going to be shot on 16. We got to a point in pre-pro that, you know, the line producer was like, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just, I, I know how, how hot you are on the 16, but I'm just going to let you know, if you shot this digitally, you could have, this many more days and you could have these extra tools. Uh, you know, and I was like, no, I'm, I'll give up all the steady cam days just so I can have the 16. So like, you know, here's the thing. It's like, it's a dance with the, the, the financing of it all. It's, you know, understanding the reality of what that choice means. You know, um, you can't run the, you can't keep the camera rolling all the time. You know, you can't do these rolling takes where you do three takes in a row. You know, there's a, the, physically, I mean, there's there's a limit on the mags, you know, that the mags can only last for 11 minutes or, you know. Also, another consideration is that I'm not getting the dailies for at least three days. It's got to be packaged. It's got to be sent off to Photochem, you know, and, and processed and scanned and uploaded to the cloud. So, you know, um, I'm not seeing what I'm getting till three days later. It's very scary. 
you know, and some of the locations you might not be able to get back. So it's a commitment and, and here's what it does. I think in one sense, there are limitations, but as we all know, as filmmakers, sometimes those limitations are good. It requires us to be on our game. It, it requires the actors know we're shooting on film and money's rolling through that camera. They tend to be a little bit more attentive, you know, when they say rolling, you know, um, everybody's a little bit more just focused. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you just there. Are, I couldn't tell you the, the, the times where I wish I, I, you know, was on digital and I could just just keep the camera rolling, just move the camera, you know, especially at that party scene. We only had one day to shoot that entire party scene. We're doing a dinner table scene with like eight people. And I'm like, if I was shooting digital, I could probably shoot like three cameras and cover the shit out of the scene. But I have one camera, <laughs> you know, I got to I got to cut. I got to move it. We got to re-meter. And, you know, it's a thing. People, folks who are listening or watching, if you have not seen Blue Bayou, see it immediately. This is a exceptional film with incredible performances. Um, I just want to commend you again. I mean, I was very, very moved by the film. I want to thank you for being with us today, Justin. We do do a, a, a quick little wrap up at the end of every episode. We call it Small Bites, where we're just going to ask you some quick questions and you can just give us quick responses to these questions. Okay. What do you think is the most important quality of a film director? Uh, listening. If you could watch any piece of content for the first time again, what would that be? I wanna see the first, first ever Twitch stream. <laughs> I'd love to see <laughs> what the hell that was just so I could try to wrap my head around like how that whole that, that all that, that just, that whole phenomenon happened. Awesome. I love it. Who is your favorite director of all time? Ooh, that's all, that's an impossible question. I mean, it's an impossible question. I guess, you know, I'm an 80s kid, uh, Spielberg, you know, like uh, growing up watching his films was like, you were just watching magic happen and, and, and the mastery of the craft, you know, I, I can only try to, to work on my craft to, to understand how he made, you know, those films at that time. Great answer. Is there a genre that you have yet to work in that you would like to? I'd like to do more action and maybe a psychological thriller. What's your favorite treat or a snack from craft services? <laughs> um, beef, beef jerky. <laughs> <laughs> Bold. And uh, last one, if you could give uh, one piece of advice to yourself in your early career, what would it be? Ooh, just keep failing. Just keep doing and keep failing. That, that's, that's a, I think I, younger, I just didn't want to get anything, any, anything wrong. I was too much of a perfect perfectionist and I was too worried about what other people thought. I, if I could go back, I would just keep doing and failing over and over and over. Awesome. Uh, we want to thank you again for sharing your process with us. Uh, you're as smart as any director we've ever spoken to. I mean, the way that your, your level of experience from, from acting through directing, the, the fact that you write as well, it's all commendable that, you, you know, you are a true multi-hyphenate and that is a very difficult thing to do, let alone do well. We're huge fans uh, and we're really looking forward to what you do next. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'll find the pizza. I'm going to find that pizza. I, I hope so. <laughs> we're, we're going to send another. <laughs> Thank you for watching and listening, everyone. Manja Bene. Except for the guy who stole Justin's pizza, known Manja Bene. Yeah, no Manja Bene for you, brother. Oh, yeah.